Bienvenidas. Welcome everyone to our third Latinas Lead Virtual Leadership Series event. I am Patricia Varela Rivera, a Senior Managing Fellow and one of the visionaries behind the creation and the development of the, of the Las Mujeres Valientes Fellowship. Many of you know me as PBR and I'm a native of New Mexico. I'm also the president and owner of PBR Solutions, a consulting firm that specializes in small business advice, coaching, strategic planning, government and public policy consulting, creative marketing, community and public affairs and leadership development, particularly for women and minorities. We're so excited today to bring you a stimulating discussion on the trends on leadership styles for Latinas. We are here with two amazing women from Colorado who are very powerful and influential. Juana Bordas, who is our guest speaker, and Fran Coleman will be our moderator today. More to come later on about these two great mujeres. This event is being brought to you by the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado, which is LCFC, with support from Next 50 Initiative, Excel Energy, Alpine Bank, and Las Mujeres Valientes Senior Fellows. A fellowship including not only myself, but five other women. And I'd like to introduce them. We have Ana Baez, and she's from Aurora, Colorado. We have Betty Aragon Mitotes, and she's from Fort Collins. We have Verna Hostetter from Alamosa. Dolores Bresida from Fort Morgan and Francis Natividad Coleman, who is the fellow in Denver, Colorado. Inspired by Women of Wisdom, it's called WOW. We are called Women of Wisdom because we're Latinas 50 plus. And the Las Mujeres Valientes Statewide Fellowship, LMV, was created to reduce ageism, promote health and well-being, create shared learning environments and transfer knowledge and wisdom so that all of our generations of Latinas can thrive and support each other. I want to also thank the LCFC staff for their amazing support and their pre-work on this event of Zoom and particularly today's Zoom event. They're, they've done an amazing job, so thank you so very much. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. We have simultaneously translation available for our Spanish-speaking participants. Envira Guzman, founder of the Community Language Cooperative, has joined us as our interpreter for this event. Please select the language you would like to participate in. You should have the most up-to-date version of Zoom to click on the interpretation option on the right-hand corner of your computer. If you're not bilingual in Spanish and English, we ask you to please click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of the screen. And if you are on a computer, please do that. If you're on a phone or an iPad, please click on more or the three dots to find the interpretation icon. Please select the language you'd like to participate in, in English or Spanish. If you are fluently bilingual, feel free to keep, to keep it off and listen to all the original speakers. If you have any issues with interpretation, please reach out via chat on your computer. Thank you very much. So now I would like to introduce Diana Aldapa, and she is from the LCFC staff, and she will provide you with the interpretation directions in Spanish. Diana. Hola, si usted no es bilingüe en español e inglés, le pedimos que haga clic en el icono de interpretación en la parte inferior de la pantalla si está en una computadora. Si está en un celular o iPad, haga clic, uh, seleccione en más o en los tres puntitos para encontrar el icono de interpretación. Seleccione el idioma en el que desea participar, inglés o español. Si usted es 
bilingüe con fluidez, siéntase libre de mantenerlo apagado y escuchar a todos los participantes en ambos idiomas. Si tiene algún problema con la interpretación, por favor, mándenos un chat. Gracias a todos, todos. Ok, so let's move on. What we're going to talk about is, it says all participants have been muted to avoid any noise or other uh, disturbances during the discussion. We have planned for a 15-minute Q&A, questions and answers from participants at the end of the program, about 5.15 or so. Please utilize the questions function found at the bottom of your screen. There will also be a post-event survey. And uh, the LCFC staff will be sending you a post-event survey. Please take a few moments to complete. We appreciate your feedback on the program and we uh, can improve so that we can improve these virtual events. So the polling is going to begin now. So we would like to see who has joined us today. So we want to start with a few quick polls. Question number one, what generations do you belong to? The silent generation, the baby boomer, Generation X, millennials, or Generation Z. And you'll notice the dates in parentheses in terms of your uh, birth year that you were born. So please take time to fill that out. Okay, let's see who we've got with us today. Wow. Okay, here we go. There's 19%, well, 40% uh, millennials, Generation Y, 18 or 38% of Generation X, and 17% of baby boomers, and 4% of Generation Z. Very good. So we've got Generation X and Millennials. That's our highest group. Great. Let's go on to question number two. Where are you located right now? Are you in Denver, Front Range, Central Mountains, Western Slope, San Luis Valley, Eastern Plains, Southern Colorado, or out of state, other than Colorado? Please take time to fill that out. Por favor. Okay, let's see where all of you are from. Denver, it's 57%. Uh, Front Range, 10%. Central Mountains, 4%. Western Slope, 14%. Yay, San Luis Valley, 6%. Great. Eastern Plains, 4% of you. Uh, Southern Colorado, 2% of you. And we even have some people from out of state. Yay, I love it. Good, well, thank you. Now we're gonna go to uh, question number three. What level of your leadership journey are you in? Are you a beginner, moderate, intermediate, or are you an expert? Please take time to fill that out. Okay, let's see what the poll says. Okay, beginners, we have 11% of you. Moderate, in terms of leadership, is 44% of you, great. Intermediate is 36%, that's wonderful. And 9% of you are experts, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for filling out the poll. We appreciate it. That gives us a good idea of who's on, you know, on this Zoom um, event. And also it'll help uh, Juana 
and Fran, in terms of the kinds of questions that you may ask and, you know, to give an idea of, of who's there that we can really talk to. Okay, next, what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce, and again, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's discussion. Frances Natividad Coleman is a woman of wisdom, known to most as Fran Coleman, and is a former state representative who served eight years in the Colorado House of Representatives. She grew up in Weld County, a daughter of migrant workers, and worked in the field starting at age 13. Fran enjoyed a 31-year career in the telecommunications industry and is a Latina working in corporate America. It was often challenging to her in reference to break the glass ceiling. Undeterred by many roadblocks, Fran worked her way through school while raising two great young sons as a single mother and achieved her undergraduate degree from Loretto Heights College in Business Administration and then went on to earn a Master's of Science in Telecommunications at Denver University. Education was something that Fran knew would overcome many a roadblock. She's worked diligently doing outreach for the Latino community and the other diverse communities, particularly women, providing political and candidate services and is highly respected because of her unique ability to demonstrate excellent diplomacy on bipartisan issues. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Fran Coleman, a dear friend. Here you go, Fran. Hello, hola. I'm so honored and excited to introduce our guest speaker, which you will soon learn has not let any grass grow under her feet. Welcome, Juana Borbas. Thank you so much, Fran. It's a pleasure to be with everyone. We yeah. have. Juana Borbas is a recognized Latina who has worked extensively on Latino leadership and is an award-winning author of two books, Salsa, Soul, and Spirit, Leadership for a Multicultural Age, and The Power of Latino Leadership, Culture, Inclusion, and Contribution. She's also the owner and president of Mestiza Leadership International. As a young child, she immigrated to the United States with her parents and her four siblings from Nicaragua. Boy, I have a hard time with that word. I'm glad you're not making me say that 10 times. She was the first to attend college, working her way through the University of Florida, while at the same time advocating to integrate the school back in 1963. Can you imagine? She was a founder and an ex executive director for the Mikasa Women's Center in 1977, and she became, which became a national model for women's empowerment. <clears throat> in 1987, she was the founding, uh, a, the founding president and CEO, CEO of the National Hispanic Leadership Institute, which is the only program that prepares Latinas for national leadership. In 2001, Juana found the circle of Latina leadership to prepare the next generation of leaders. She was selected as a wise woman award. I'm going to take a drink of water because I'm losing it here. <laughs> and it doesn't have anything special in it. <clears throat> She was selected as a Wise Woman Award by the National Center of, of Women's Policy Studies and is in the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame, which is no small feat. In 2009, the Denver Post and the Colorado Women's Foundation named her the Colorado Unique Woman of the Year. Whether you are just starting your leadership career or you're already a recognized leader, our discussion today will implore us to enhance our heritage in developing our trends and leadership style. Juana? Wow, well, first of all, let me thank everyone who's here with us today. Patricia, for your generous uh, work on this. Las Mujeres Valientes Fellows, 
the next 50 initiative, and I hope we're all here for the next 50, Excel Energy, Alpine Bank, and of course, the Latino Community Foundation staff. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us and for taking time to connect, to learn, and to grow our skills that we might be more inclusive and more powerful in the state of Colorado. Again, welcome Juana and thank you for joining us today. We want to definitely spend some time discussing your two books that you've written, The Salsa, Soul and Spirit, and then The Power of Latina Leadership. But first, we want to spend as much time as we can going over your life from a little immigrant girl to now a highly successful Latina leader. Tell us where it began and where you are today and what you want to share with Latinas of all ages during this program. I will ask you questions along the way that some of our fellows have submitted or as something occurs. So you'll welcome my interruptions. They'll be nice. Of course. <laughs> well, you know, it is so important for all of us to share our stories and to remember where we came from, because I really believe it's, that is our strength. Our roots are our strength that, that nourish us. Um, so I came over at three years old. I was only three years old uh, with my mother and there were six of us in the boat. We came over on a boat from Nicaragua and um, my, my father and two sisters had come over early to earn money to bring the family over here. And many of us are immigrants. Some of us have been here since before this was Colorado and some of us are recently uh, in the state, but we all have our stories and our experience. Well, mine was my mother uh, actually going to the church and saying to the priest, I can cook, I can clean, I can take care of children. Puedo cocinar, limpiar, cuidar niños. And that's such a humble thing that our immigrant parents and people do. They are looking for work. And then she clinched the deal by saying, I came here so my children could have a better life. I came here so my children could become educated. And I always say that the priest couldn't resist a, a selfless soul like that. And I always believe that I've learned leadership from my mother and my older siblings, because I was the youngest daughter of this large tribe of people who came over here, probably resembling some of you here and have had to make your way. I believe that the immigrant experience makes us innovative and resourceful. It makes us have hope, esperanza. My mother knew without, a, 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 without any doubt that God was good and that we would make it uh, as a family. And we have, I come from a So uh, part, of, uh, part of your uh, background, I read that you came over on a banana boat. Uh, I did. What was what was that about? Was it a ship or was it well, uh, what I what I envision is like the small thing with oh no, bananas? Oh no, we're on talking it. we're talking a huge cargo boat with bananas and coconuts, probably some tarantulas walking around, and we were in the hull of the boat. The only thing I remember, because I was only three, was that there were some bunk beds lined up. It was pretty dark in there, you know. So we <laughs> first class ticket. And one of the reasons we left Nicaragua is that there had been a tsunami that had wiped out the coast uh, and it hadn't been. And so my parents, and this is where we really have to think about who our parents are. As humble as they were, they had this vision of the future for their children. They had this determination. They were not going to give up and they didn't, right? And so look at that kind of responsibility and service and vision and stamina and determination. We come from greatness. We come from people who had in their minds, my children's life would be better. Okay, uh, Juana, uh, can you speak a little louder? You're fading out. Thank okay. you. Yeah, okay, am I, am I okay now? You're good, you're good now. Okay, because so. I can up the volume. Yeah. How about if I do that? Okay, that, that's good. Can I do that? Okay. So, well, you're great. So the other area that I wanted you to concentrate on that really keyed my interest was uh, when you started going to college, your mom's working, working hard to make sure that you, you, you were the first one of all your siblings to attend. Is that correct? She froze. Do you think our younger generation of Latinas today seek careers before settling down and having a family? 
What do you think, Fran? Um, I think it's a mixed bag. Yeah, I, I have I a, I have a one of our our young Latinas. Uh, she just had a baby, but she's forty and it's her first child. And it's real obvious that she went ahead and, and uh, took care of her career first. Um, but, you know, there's others that still start out young. But, uh, and, you know, for myself, I, I had my first child when I was 21. That made me legal to have a baby, right? Hi, Juana, we got you back. So she's connecting to the audio. So anyway, what it, so, and then I had my second child at age 24. So they were almost three years apart. And even with that age difference, I was still a very busy mama. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm kind of I'm kind of like Fran, you know, when you're a baby boomer, you know, it was the married, oh, can you see this now? Oh, okay, <laughs> there we go. And if Juana comes on, we'll just be quiet because, you know, she's our, she's our number one speaker here. But when you, um, I was like Fran. I, I uh, had a child at the age of 19, and um, it was not easy. And I think that we were acclimated at our age to, you know, get married and have children, and a career wasn't really anything that we were looking at. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Or even going to college. Thank God I went to college. But I also think what happens is that you younger women, especially millennials and younger women, you have so many great opportunities. Juana, can you hear us? Oh, yeah, she's just connecting to the audio right now. But you have so many wonderful opportunities. And I think I, I agree with Fran. It's a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. I think some young women want to have a family and children. But I think what's happening, too, there's a lot of you out there that want to get educated and are not ready to get married and want to have a good career. And I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I learned as I got older, having a good career was really good for me because I'm, I was an only child. I never had anyone take care of me or, you know, uh -huh. we were not a rich family yeah. and it was hard. Right. And so I think what happens is that we, um, we, 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 we do it, as we say in New Mexico, a trote moche, that, you know, we're, um, we're just going by the seat of our pants. Does that make sense, mm -hmm. Fran? Mm -hmm. And so for me, I started my career and um, it got better and better. And I realized I was going up the career ladder and making a little bit more money so that I could raise my son. And, you know, my, my lifestyle got better. Right. Right. And then when I got in the government, I just want to tell, then I'll let Fran talk, mm -hmm. but I just want to tell all of you, you need to get into a career where you have a retirement plan and a health plan. Because that's why I went back in the federal government after several years, because I, I was scared. I, I didn't, I wasn't married and I haven't remarried since forever, 50 some years. But thank the Lord, I had a retirement plan, mm -hmm. and I had good health care. There's one. Juana, are you there? Juana? I am just crushed. My internet totally went down. All right, we okay. got you. Well, okay. you're not, you're you're not crushed anymore. We're okay. We're okay. <laughs> I was asking you when, uh, when you went away uh, what it was like for you to... Um, what inspired you to uh, go after the uh, University of Florida and just ask them to integrate as young as you were in 1963? How old would you have been at that point? Um, I was uh, 19 years old. Um, I think that if all of us reach down and think about our early experiences, we've all had different types of discrimination. And for me, I was a girl growing up in the 40s and 50s. You know, I was an immigrant. I was um, low income. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't speak English till I went into school. And my mother was terribly discriminated against. I say she had a cultural nervous breakdown. So what? here's this. Yeah, I mean, here's, here's our immigrants who come and they're respected in their hometown. People know who they are, you know. And again, like I was saying, I think immigrants are leaders. I mean, they're here seeking a better life. They have vision. And so I already knew what discrimination was. And, and I have to say that 
at that time when I was in college, I was trying to fit in. A lot of us have done that, especially people that are our age, you know. Mm -hmm. I was trying to fit in because Latinos were not a group. We weren't even a group till the 1980s. And so I had a lot of identity issues. But I knew immediately when I saw this group organizing to integrate the University of Florida, because there were no blacks there either. You got to remember, this is before segregate integration in the South. I knew immediately it was the right thing to do. And they say in leadership that if you trust your intuition, that which tells you what is right or wrong, uh, you know, that that's where you have to get, what do I do now? You ask yourself, what is the right thing to do? And so I, I like to say that I got up and I got in line and that I'm still standing. Oh, good for you. Good for you. And, uh, and it's those uh, lessons that we learn along the way in fighting for what's right mm -hmm. is really what really uh, strengthens us. Uh, so I'm going to move on and ask you some more about uh, so you were basically in Florida, and then from Florida you went where, and then how did you land in Denver? Well, I think an important thing for us to realize as Latinas is that, you know, I, I was raised with a sense of responsibility, and I think we are raised that way, that we're responsible for our families, we're responsible for our community, you know, that, that we are really here to make a contribution and to work with other people, you know. So I had this incredible sense of gratitude and a sense of responsibility. How could I be a young immigrant girl and end up having the prize of a college education? And, um, and so the year I graduated from college, John F. Kennedy died, you know? And for the millennials and, and the young people that are on the line, I'm so happy to have you because he talked at that time about a new generation of leaders. And that's what we need today. We need the millennials and, and those that are our elders are here to help to step up and to become a new generation of leaders because there's so many crises, particularly in our community today with COVID and essential workers. So I had this incredible sense of responsibility and John F. Kennedy started the Peace Corps. And so I joined the Peace Corps after college. But here's the, here's the beautiful thing. I had grown up in a cultural no man's land. You know, there was no Spanish. There were no Latinos, no groups, no Latina sororities, no organizations, all the stuff we've created today in the last 50 years. And, um, and so when I went to Chile, that's when I knew what a Latino was. That's when I knew what a Hispanic was. That's when I knew the power of our culture. How could I have grown up in a country, which I totally respect, the land of opportunity, I got an education, but I had never seen a Latino bus driver. I'd never had a teacher. I'd never seen, we had these little tiendas, right? But I'd never seen a Latino working in a fancy store or running their own big company or, or anything like that. And then I go to a great country where everybody's Latino, the presidents of the universities, the head of the airlines, and I'm saying to myself, it ain't my culture. It's not who we are because we are great people. It's this prejudice, it's these obstacles, it's the fact that we do not live in an inclusive society that values the gifts of all of its people. Mm -hmm. So how long were you in Chile? Mm -hmm. I was in Chile for two years, and um, what I did there, which was interesting to me, was I did, um, I started production co-ops. I had a group of women that sewed and made things. I had a group of women that knitted, and we bought, a, we actually bought a, a large loom. It was kind of like micros today. That's what it's called today. Yeah, I had a woman, mm -hmm. a group of women that baked. And uh, so when I went to, to work with Mikasa, and we ended up doing the business center, and like Patricia was in the Small Business Administration. And today, Latinas, not Latinos, Latinas are the fastest growing business, small business sector, because we've got that entrepreneurial know-how. That's what I did in the Peace Corps. So when I came back, wow. It's 300% today, Latina yeah. growing. But I think that's why identity is so important too, because I got to tell you, the young Latina that got on the plane to go to Chile, was not the one that came back. I was in power. <laughs> Look I out knew, America. <laughs> I knew I had to do something for my people and that it had been all of these obstacles that were in our way. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think me going to college is the thing. Me opening the door. I will tell you this, um, three and a half years ago, I got the opportunity to be the speaker for the incoming Latino 
uh, group for the University of Florida, the freshmen, and there were 1,500 of us. And the next year, a Latina was elected president. And I was the only Latina at the University of Florida in the early 60s. So that's progress. And that's what I want young people to hold on to. 50 right. years from now, we're going to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. So, awesome. um, so uh, take me to uh, how you got to Denver and, uh, and your Mi Casa work and, and also the Latina leadership. Take me to that. Oh, well, the women are going to love this story. In the Peace Corps, of course, I married this dashing Irishman. Oh, my. Oh, yes. I didn't oh, know yes. that part. <laughs> <laughs> I this dashing more. Irishman. <laughs> <laughs> and he was going to go back to school and to become a lawyer. He was from Wisconsin. So as the young, dutiful Hispanic wife, uh, I went with him. But I do want to tell this story, especially to young women and the people that are really looking to what is it am I set to do? What is my calling? How can I best contribute? How can I best serve? These are all questions you ask yourself if you really want to tap into your, your power and your leadership. And so um, I went to get a job so that I could work while my dashing Irish husband was going to law school, right? This is all right. what we Latinas do, right? We're gonna support everybody. So I go to um, the social service department and by this time I have a portfolio of all the people I helped in Chile. We were actually in the newspaper because we served our sweets and our bakery goods to the Chilean legislature. That's what you gotta do. You gotta connect the community to the legislature like you did, Fran, when you were there. Right. So I had this portfolio and I go to the guy and I'm looking for a job as a social worker and he says, uh, he says, I'm really sorry, he says, but uh, we don't hire people here unless they have a master's in social work. And I looked at him and I was incredulous. I had a college degree. The first person in my lineage, in my generation, the first woman, I thought I could do anything right. So I slammed my papers on the table and I looked at him in the face and I said, uh, you don't understand. I was born to be a social worker. Now where I got those cojones is another story, probably from my mother. And he was so frustrated. He said, okay, if you go to the University of Wisconsin and, and, and enroll in the social work school, we'll give you a stipend if you'll come back and work for us, which I did. But the story is that you got to believe in yourself and you got to know what you're here to do, right? And you can't let people stand in your way. Even if he wouldn't have given me that opportunity, I was going to become a social worker. I was going to help my people. And so when we finished our graduate program and I worked in Wisconsin, we wanted to find, and this again, ladies, is how we do things. We wanted to find a place that had the Latino culture, Colorado, that had four seasons for my ex-husband, right? That oh, he's an ex now? Yeah. He's an ex now at this point? Well, I don't call him an ex, and this is a tip. Okay, good. I call him my friend Theron. And here's what I have to say to the ladies that are divorced. Why talk bad about your ex-husbands? Because you chose it. You right. chose it. Those are your ex-husbands, right? <laughs> it was so, one of the stages in your life. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 if, and if they're not that great, then look at yourself and find out why you pick someone like that. Because if you don't figure that out, you might pick another one. <laughs> <laughs> you too, Gina. <laughs> so, yeah, he's, he's you're, great you're true. Yeah. It's so true. He became a legal service attorney, and he was a warrior like me. He was a warrior. He, he fought the good fight. He went out. He sued the... The, uh, he sued the migrant camp uh, companies for false advertising and bringing people here without, you know, without giving them work and putting them in those shacks. So, yeah, I, I, and I, think, I think basically not just your husbands, but the people, husbands, plural, because I've had two. <laughs> but it's not just the people, you know, it's the people you surround yourself with, you know, and I have been very fortunate. Fran's a friend of mine. Patricia's a friend of mine. The people at the the community foundation because you want to surround yourself with people that have good intentions and that really want to make the world a better place that's what i learned from my parents 
Right. My mother sacrificed her entire life so I could be with you here today. Right. You know, she did right. everything for her children. And so I follow in her footsteps. What can I do for mm -hmm. young people, for other people, you know, to make sure that we keep progressing, mm -hmm. not just as a community, so, but as I'm a I'm going to stop you there for a minute. But I remember last year when, we, when uh, PBR and I rolled out the Mujeres Valientes, our very first event. And you came dashing in with your wonderful energy and hugged me and all that. Boy, I miss hugs. Yep. <laughs> anyway, um, the one thing you said to me is, I came to see what this is about and however I can support you. And I was thinking to myself, geez, this woman's written two books and she's a leader and she's over here asking me how she can help. I, you know, the thing is, is you have never forgotten your grassroots. You have never forgotten how to empower women. And I just really appreciated um, your remarks around that and how powerful that was. Well, I admire you all for doing this because, you know, women are the connectors. We are the connectors. And this is the hundredth year of our vote. Not, you know, not, not black women or Latino women because, you know, we had to do some maneuvering to get to the ballot box, but still it's, it's an important event, the hundred years. And what I think is that if women would step up to leadership in whatever capacity, my mother went on to start a little daycare center and became a, an entrepreneur taking care of children. And she loved children so much that she said, I'm not afraid to die because the children will open the gates of heaven for me. And so she had her purpose, see? Her purpose yeah. was helping children. And sometimes she would take welfare mother's children and, you know, charge them a dollar or something. Um, but in any case, it's that whole idea that women, wherever we are, whether we're, you know, uh, whether we're in Fort Collins or Greeley or Colorado Springs, we have the capacity to be leaders and we have the capacity to encourage and support the next generation. And, you know, to me, it's not even something I do. It's the, it's what gives my life meaning. You know what I mean? So many people, like they say right now, half the people are depressed because of COVID. And if I was depressed, my mother would say, get up and do something for somebody else. That was her piece of advice. Exactly. Uh, and it doesn't mean you don't deal with the, tu corazón and tu aches and pains y todo eso. Pero the more you dwell on that kind of stuff, instead of really empowering yourself to say, wow, you know, I have something to give today. Uh, who, who, whose life am I going to make better? Right, exactly. So, so go on and, and tell us a little bit about your, the inspiration for Mikasa and, uh, and uh, some of the women that have come out that come to mind um, that you uh, were able to, um, to inspire and to, uh, to make a difference with. Well, I think the important thing, the important lesson for Mikasa for the women that are listening is that there were only seven of us. I always like to say Jesus only had 12. We had seven. <laughs> so don't think, I mean, it was you and Patricia and a couple of others that had the inspiration for this. So don't think you have to have a, you know, an army of people to do something significant. You just have to have a very, a, a group of committed people. And so I was working in the Barrios of West Denver as a social worker. And um, I got a call from the minister of the Mennonite church that said there's daycare mothers here that want to know why their kids are getting an education and they're not. And I thought, wow, this is the day I've been waiting for because I had been a feminist um, since my days at the University of Wisconsin where I got my graduate degree. And, um, and I thought, wow, this is really something. So I gathered up some people and we went and we met with the daycare mothers. And when it first started, we were kind of like a team of finding out what is it women need. You always have to know that. So we did a community survey. Um, the beginnings were very, very humble. We started off in the basement of the Mennonite church. And then we rented a house for $350 a month or something. I don't know how much. But the thing that we need to think about is it's been over 40 years. And I'd like to, because of my age, to share that perspective, particularly with young women and people that are starting things, because we need so many things in rural Colorado and in the other, you know, in Pueblo and Colorado Springs. It doesn't have to start with a, with, you just have to plant the seed, start building on it, make sure you're in sync with the needs of the people you're serving. 
and little by little it grows because Mi Casa is now over 40 years old and it's the largest Hispanic serving organization in the state of Colorado. And I attribute that to the thousands and thousands and thousands of Latinas that have gone there and worked and shared and graduated from the business uh, from from the the business um, program, and uh, who have found jobs and who have educated themselves. Um, what, one of the people that worked with me at Mikasa was Elsa Olguin. She was on staff, and many of you may know Elsa. She's gone on to be a great daycare advocate, one of the most important things in our community, and she now heads up the 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 daycare organization for the whole area, Metro Denver, and works statewide. Um, so each one of us that have graduated from there or have worked at Mikasa have gone on, taken our skills, and then done other things for our community. Right. And, and you know, it's been so inspiring. As I uh, mentor young women, one of the first things I send them to is to Mikasa and, and show them the array of all of the different classes that they can take. Some of them are very beginner and some of them are intermediate. But yeah. it's such a great program. and. Uh, I recently had one of my dear friends uh, that I didn't even know was attending. She was starting a new business with her family because she came into an inheritance and she wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, that they used some money wisely and she wanted to have this family business. But because it was a family, she wanted to make sure that she ran it like a business. And so she went to Mikasa on her own and she was so inspired and so yeah. inspired. Yeah. Well, two things I want to say that I think would be good for the women. Um, first of all, I talked about identity and I, how I did not become powerful until I went to Chile, figured out what it meant to be a Latina, figured out what the assets of my culture was, who are you and your identity, and to really connect to the Latino culture from that perspective. What are our assets? You know, why are we such a great people, which we are. Mm -hmm. um, but Mi Casa, our first um, logo was a house with a woman symbol in the middle. And I really want to make this distinction between Latinas and, and shall we say, mainstream feminist or uh, white feminist. We always believed that the house symbolized our family and our community, that Latina advancement has to be all of us. What good does it do us to advance if our community doesn't and if our children don't have the kind of opportunities they need? So that's a real important thing for us to remember. Latinas, and, and remember Latina means your culture and your gender. And right. so we, we move everybody up as we go. And the second thing is, is that Mikasa was was and this has been one of the things i've dedicated my life to it was built around latino values when you walked in the door it was a cultural space uh, we used groups instead of individuals we looked at latinas needing to learn skills like english or finish their high school degrees or get employment you know it was based on critical needs of our community and, and, and so I think that culture, having the generosity, calling it mi casa, su casa, and really looking at how we bring our culture with us as we move forward. So I think those are two things that, that women really, you know, that's our role, that's our role. We are the connectors, we are the heart of the home, the heart of the community, and we're here to preserve and to celebrate the beauty of who we are as Latinos. So, so of course, the question comes to mind, do you think that uh, that value of mi casa is, to, is su casa is as strong as it was then, or, or do you think it's uh, faded, or is it getting stronger? Give me a sense of that. Well, I think it's both things. Um, one mm -hmm. thing that we have to realize is that nobody teaches us about our culture. You know, I can... I can uh, I use dichos a lot of times to teach people leadership and to teach people who we are. For example, donde come uno como come dos, where one person eats, two people can eat. Because in the Latino worldview, I don't want to be sitting there eating if you don't have anything to eat, right? Well, that's shared leadership. That's collaborative leadership. That's people-centered leadership to care about people enough to share what you have. And so I think a lot of Latinos and, and or Latinas as well are growing up 
with their cultural values, but there's nobody there to translate to them how this makes them a leader or what are the, what are the contributions we're going to make because of our culture. And so a lot of my work has to do with that. You know, my, my book on the power of Latino leadership begins with history and culture. We need to know our history and who we are. We need to connect to our culture. We need to understand our values. And so I think that is a missing link for many of us. Um, I had to learn it and that's why I teach it as well because we don't learn it in the schools and because culture permeates everything you do a lot of times you're not conscious of the fact right that your culture is really driving you to be of service or driving you to be more generous you know or asking you trabajar porque donde donde uh, si no trabajas no comen which means everybody can <laughs> yes, everybody works <laughs> We're the hardest working group probably on the planet, you know. We have the highest participation in the, in the labor market. And so work is one of our treasured values. And we'll do anything in order to have the dignidad del trabajo. We're never going to take a helping hand if we, if we can, I mean, a, a handout if we can give a helping hand. That's kind of a good one. <laughs> no yeah. handouts, just helping that's hands. Something, just helping that's hands. something that uh, we as Latinos and Latinas are are very proud of is that um, if we can provide it ourselves we will and if we can give we will so uh, with that I'm gonna go ahead and move us into some of these questions because time's gone going by pretty fast here so um, one of the questions that came in is um, do you think the family values have changed regarding servant leadership and basically servant leadership is uh, a person who leads but make sure everybody else is is being included and uh, and you empower those people as well yeah well the thing is is that um you know a lot of people have problems with the term servant leadership but the real means is that if you look at traditional leadership you look at it today we can see it in political leaders we can see it in corporate leaders that style of leadership where people take more than their share that's about dominance and control uh, that type of leadership doesn't really work if you want to empower and develop people which should be the role of the leader the leader should be you know guiding mentoring supporting other leaders that's really our job and so I, I think that we do do that in our community if you look at see latinos the way we're going to get to power is through collective power it's through critical mass power so we should be in our communities developing as many people as we can to be civically engaged because that's the only way we're going to get there uh, right. for our community so, I, and I think if you look at the young generation, they're activists, they're out there working, they're hoping to change things, they're concerned about climate change and about immigration and about the uh, police brutality and all these things. So I do think it's there, uh, the whole idea of serving and leading and that, that leadership is not about position or power or prestige, but leadership is really serving your community, serving other people, and making sure that other people have a pathway to become uh, productive and, and to be leaders as well. So it's there. I still think that these kind of forums where we talk about it and make, it, make ourselves more aware of it gives us mo more power. Good. So uh, what comes to mind for me is collective leadership. Yeah and uh, figuring out how to bring what I one of the first things that Patricia and I talked about when we established the Mujeres Valientes with LCFC and that is, is that our responsibility is to bring people behind us because one of these days we're not going to be on this earth but hopefully we made a difference exactly well, and actually, that's why human beings evolved, because my mother did everything she could to make my life better. All right. three of my daughters have advanced degrees. I'm very proud of them. I have a professor, a special ed teacher, and, and uh, someone who works in a nonprofit, because they learned from me and my mother. Now, my mother had a smaller scope, right? She was just helping children and working in the community and doing some things at church, but she instilled in me that idea that the meaning of life. But uh, look at how many how many lives she impacted for every child she took care of. Right. That, that, so when, when I teach woman that took care of them, yeah. 
Yeah, when yeah. I teach leadership, I, you know, we do leadership projects and I say, you're looking at my mother's leadership project. It was me. <laughs> right, right. So I have another question for you. How come, uh, how can millennials, I can't get the word out, build on leadership and accomplishments from previous generations? People like Well, us. that is beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when I was running the circle of Latina leadership, and I'm very proud of that because we have 165 young Latinas in the Denver metro area uh, that are, you know, have stepped up to leadership or leading organizations and all of that. Um, I don't like the word mentor and neither do millennials. We like the word ally. Mm -hmm. And ally also resonates with servant leadership because everybody can contribute. Everybody can lead in different capacities, right? Um, and so what you have to do in order to really learn from the other generation is do what we're doing now. Do intergenerational leadership just like you would look around and say, wait a minute, what about diversity? Well, diversity is age as well, right? Mm -hmm. right. And, and the lifespan doubled in the last century. So we have four generations now. And with the new generation, it's going to be five with the, with the Z. Mm -hmm. So make sure that your circle of people um, includes people that are more seasoned, people that can share with you their perspective, who can say, this is what we did. I don't know if it'll work now. Um, you know, but really, in, you know, include in your circle people that have different, um, not only generations, but work in different fields and in different perspectives. I love the fact that we have a series of people on the calls from boomers to the Zs, because this is what we need. We need to right. really support and learn from each other. So, um, so younger people, yes, let's, let's, let's look at it and let's study our history because a lot of times if we don't know our history and we don't know where we've been, we don't know where we're going. Where we're going. So while we were having a few technical uh, <laughs> difficulties, uh, Patricia and I kind of spoke to each other and we tackled a question that, that I'm going to give to you now. And that is, is, do you think our younger generation of Latinas today seek careers before settling down and having a family? Well, that's a great question because when I was um, running the circle of Latina leadership, I would say to them, hey, you can have it all, but not all at once. You know, you can't have it all at once because uh, the younger generation, really, the, they're so motivated. They're getting advanced degrees. Uh, my assistant for many years, Jennifer, Lo Gen Jennifer Villalobos, I'm so proud of her, oldest girl in an immigrant family, so you get out of the way because she knows how to do everything, has now been accepted in a PhD program. And I'm like, Jennifer, slow down, you know? Um, so that's one thing I encourage young Latinas to do is to enjoy the process because they're, 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 they're so motivated to get educated, to get that next promotion, to get that next job, to go to the next thing. And really, um, in integrating yourself is where your power comes from. You know, we're putting all the pieces together so you have that strength. I do think that, um, that they are having their children later, at least the educated ones. We're, we're talking class here. But the kind of women that I've worked with, a lot of times, you know, they, they, they want to have their career. They want to do so many things in the community. They want to have a family. They, you know, want to have their hobbies and all of the other stuff they do. And then they end up having children. And, you know, as all of us know who have had children, it's nice, it's good to take a little time to enjoy your children. Even today, I didn't go back to work till my, my little girl was two and a half. I wish I would have gone back when she was four or five because you'll never be able to recoup those years. And at the same time, you can be doing community stuff or learning lots of things at home, but enjoy your children if you're going to have them like you right. did, Fran, and like I did. Right. One of the things I used to do when my kids were little is we'd go to the to the um, playground and uh, I don't know who played harder, but I think I was. I'd get on the teeter-totter, merry-go-round and, and the swings and just had just a blast with them. Of course, in those days, the body moved much better than it does now. <laughs> well, I do want to say also I, I that, 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 that was important. important. 
I think one of the reasons my children ended up being very involved in community was not just because of my example, but because I took them to things. And yeah. so when you have children, like I was over at the Museo de las Americas last week and Claudia, the director, who's a circle graduate from the circle Latina leadership, had her two kids there and they were drawing and playing, you know. So when you do have kids in the tradition of the Latino community, make them part of your work, make them part of, of helping our communities. My daughter, ended up being hostesses they ended up painting rooms they ended up working in the food banks and all of these things have enriched their lives and made them successful exactly exactly so um, what what is the main thing that you want young Latinas to gain from all your hard work one well what I um, have I've been very proud of the people that are in the streets today and of our young Latinos, the DACA students, the ones that are working on, on immigration and are working on housing and are, are really beginning to lead our organizations. And the one thing I would leave, leave them with is that I never knew when I was a young girl that this would be my life's work that when, when I, cause I marched with the early feminists, right? I was there. I worked and marched for civil rights and you know, we can say, oh, we wish we would have been further ahead, but change takes time. It takes dedication and it takes us, uh, it just, it, we're not going to win this in one lifetime. We have to keep working together. So I would encourage young people to gather that perspective because if, if the boomers would have kept it up, we wouldn't be here today. But so many people who were active in the 60s didn't continue their activism. And so therefore, that, you know, so therefore we didn't keep progressing at the rate we should have and could have. So, you know, pace yourself, you know, make sure your life's enjoyable. One of the things about the Latino culture that's so wonderful is that we celebrate life, you know, fiestas and abrazos and quinceañeras and, and family gatherings and keep celebrating your life, you know, but keep working for the advancement of your people. Paso a paso, step by step, we will get there. Right, and there's nothing like a good uh, opportunity to dance that energizes us, right, Juana? Exactly. I'm a, I'm a salsera. <laughs> right, so I have a, a question. I have a thought here. If the people who are participating, uh, we'd love to have some questions come in. So please go to the question and answer uh, section and type in your question because we definitely want Juana to address it. So, um, Juana, can you talk about current trends in leadership today? What do you think is happening? Yeah, um, well, what I'd like to do is, is kind of talk about how Latino leadership is positioned to be the next trend in leadership. <laughs> so, the first principle I would say that's so important that I um, teach is called the leader as equal, which means you as a leader are not better than anyone else. Um, you're also not entitled, um, that everybody, as we've talked about, and, and the servant leader idea is that everyone has something to contribute, whether they're going to be the cook or they're going to be the person that answers the phone or they're going to be the one that follows up with people, uh, that does the technology, it doesn't, it provides the daycare, it doesn't matter. Everyone can make a contribution. And if we do that, we get to another principle of leadership, which is leadership by the many or critical mass leadership, that change really comes from numbers and people encouraging each other to vote, to run for office, to um, start their own little nego negocio. Um, so, so that's another principle that's real important. But this whole thing that we've been talking about, collaboration, participation, leadership is now inclusive. You know, in the old days, it was a few people in charge. Right. Today, we're educated. Um, you know, the younger generation has skills and technology that we don't have. For example, my internet going out, <laughs> which is still out, by the way. But anyway, I mean, everyone has something to contribute. And as we do that, we can only do that through participatory, through being inclusive, through collaborating, to learning to work together, to being very tolerant with people. You know, we can't have it our way all the time. So mm -hmm. leadership is really moving to this participatory process because a few leaders at the top do not have the answers. 
The other thing that I think is very important is women's leadership and women lead, uh, they're people centered like Latinos are and leadership is a people business. So the more that we gleam our people skills and learn to work with different people, with different styles, with, you know, as we said, different generations, the more that we'll be able to create the kind of organizations or communities or nation that we want to, um, we want to build. So leadership has changed from more of a dominant culture, leadership by the few, to leadership by the many. Which is important, very important. So we have a, que a question that just came in. Who are some of the leaders that Juana looked up to? What did, what did they do that she appreciated? You did mention JFK, but who are some other leaders? Well, in our community, I had um, the honor of being mentored by two wonderful leaders who have passed on. One was Lena Archuleta, um, who came from um, the Trinidad area and came, she graduated from Denver University at, in like in the 20s or something. Mm -hmm. but, but Lena didn't pass on till she was like 90. And she never, ever stopped uh, participating she helps helped me with Mikasa she was one of the seven women she helped with the Latin American Education Foundation she helped with La Raza she understood and taught me that the way we gain power is through organization and right. through building community support and on top of it Lena was gracious to the point that I still would like to emulate um, she was always kind and gracious and good to people. And so people would follow her. And she tried to bring people together and, and iron things out, I would call it. Right. She was very unobtrusive. Uh, oh, yes. And, yes. Uh, you know, and I probably, whenever I drive by the school that's named after her, is, um, was really an inspiration that uh, that happened. And so she found her calling, by the way. Her calling was education. Right. And so exactly. that's an important thing for each leader to know what what is my calling? Where do I want to make my mark? And my other mentor was uh, Bernie Valdez, um, who also has a library named after him. And I do want to say the one lesson I learned from Bernie at that time. Um, I had gone off to Washington to work with the National Hispana Leadership Institute. And this is what I knew from, from being with Bernie. We would go out and have lunch, just like you do with your, you would with somebody that you respected. And he would tell me about what I was doing and how I was doing it and all this. But this was the lesson I really learned. One day he didn't have his car, so I was going to drive him home. Now you have to realize Bernie Valdez in the last century was the top Colorado statesman that was Hispanic. He was president of the school board. He had been president of the Denver Social Services. He began organizing in his basement with migrant workers. Again, you can start small. So I drive up to his house, and it's this little teeny house behind the Broncos Stadium. And I said, this is what's wrong with what I've seen in Washington. If the greatest Latino leader in our state in the last century can live in this little house, and I've been in my home for 40 years, I ain't going nowhere, can have this kind of humility and yet be a great statesman, that's who I want to follow. Because right. all of our, that, that's all of our parents. That's all the people that came before us. You know, humble, but powerful. Yeah, he was one of the founders of La Raza. Um, I'm trying to remember all the letters. Uh, Latin American Research and, Research and Service Agency. Right, right. At the time, in its prime, it was uh, basically the uh, organization that everybody went to if they were doing Latino studies or social work. Yeah, but you have to realize Bernie integrated the Denver Public Schools back to integration. Mm -hmm. um, we have to remember that we have been discriminated against and that um, when he became head of the school board, we were going to substandard and marginalized schools. And so that's when they began busing. And it was, uh, you know, people had their uh, houses, uh, you know, threatened and their lives threatened. He had courage, he stood up, he knew what was yeah, right. He did. And so he's responsible for us beginning to have education that cuts across culture, race, and socioeconomic groups. So to have mentors like that, you know, um, and both of them live their entire lives supporting, helping, advancing our community. And You're so, so that's, right. that's okay. where I get that's where I get my juice. Well, we have some more questions here. 
What keeps you motivated? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, someone asked me, I guess, and this is a little segue, how I keep my energy at, at I'm going to be 78 in two weeks. Yay! So, yay! <laughs> <laughs> uh, seven and eight or 15. I, I feel like I'm 15. No, I'm kidding. So I am very fortunate that, and, and this is an important thing that um, we had a really good diet when I was growing up. I have great genetics, first of all, because Latinos are hybrid people. We have hybrid vigor. That's another talk, but but my mother used to cook rice and beans. So we'd have rice and beans on Monday, beans and rice on Tuesday, rice and beans on Wednesday. You got to watch your diet. Right. You know, she, at that time, there was no processed food. She would buy a little six pack mm -hmm. of Coca-Cola mm -hmm. on Saturday for all eight of us. So mm -hmm. I watch my diet a lot right. uh, because you have to have energy for leadership. You do. And you have to have that energy. So I also uh, exercise and walk. I've been very fortunate that I live near City Park so I can walk City Park. But getting out and getting air and sun and walking is so important. Mm -hmm. And then again, having your comadres, having your, your group that supports you and that keeps you going. Right. I, am, I am totally inspired, however, by the next generation. I, uh, I, I am, am too. I, I am. am so inspired by those that are coming after us who are more educated, who are technologically savvy, who have a deep understanding of how things are connected. I mean, they understand mm -hmm. that poverty uh, is connected to climate change, right? Because they put the, right. they put, you know, they, they, they put the, the waste and so forth in our communities. They understand that low wages is connected to capitalism that you know right. that they have an understanding of what it's going to take to transform this world and mm -hmm. to bring the kind of values that latinos stand for into the mainstream and, and into healing and transforming uh, the situation that we have today so i want to be here as long as i can to work on that and to help with that and i'm inspired by that but i also have a very very deep religious practice i believe in the spirit i believe that we are here to do that work. Um, and I also believe that I'm protected and nurtured by this wonderful force of the universe that is good, that is benevolent, that's loving, and that treats us as their children. Right, it's so important to have a spiritual um, component to your life and to take time and, and, um, and pay attention to those the chosen lessons. <clears throat> so, um, Juana, I want to thank you so very much for the time, even despite the te despite the uh, the technology problems. But uh, I encourage people to please uh, find Juana's books because they really do incorporate how important it is for us to be in touch with our culture, our heritage, and why it matters on how we lead. It's been a delight having you and listening to your life story. You know, we think we know each other real well, and every time we get together like this, we each learn a little bit more about each other. And, uh, you know, obviously PBR, myself, you and I, we don't, we don't let grass grow under our, our feet because I, I believe that uh, our higher powers are telling us that we have to keep uh, helping and, and causing change and empowering and uh, being collaborative. So thank you everyone who signed on and who uh, who joined us today. We are so delighted. We had over 170 some people that uh, were logged on and um, thank you. I really uh, am very touched with that because one of our First ones was before 100, below 100, and so uh, it, it obviously matters what the LCFC is doing and the great leadership, especially from uh, Carlos Martinez and um, and uh, Rachel Grego, who lead who help lead the team, and they're all huge. And so Marisa and Diana, were thank you all for making this happen today. Again, Juana, que Dios te cuide. También que Dios te bendiga. ¿verdad? Adelante, Latinas. Adelante, Latinas. Adelante. Thank you all so much. God bless everyone. Take care.